Welcome to But Jesus Drank Wine and other stories that kept us stuck. I'm Mead. And I'm Christy. In this podcast, we'll explore the stories that kept us, well, stuck, wanting to drink and not wanting to drink all at the same time. Join us as we show you that freedom from alcohol does not have to mean a life sentence of misery and missing out, but actually means living an authentic life full of peace, joy, and purpose. We have today a very, very, very special guest. We have Mr. William Porter, who is the author. If you're in the sober verse or the sober curiosity verse or any of it, you already know him, but I'm just going to tell you who he is. He has written Alcohol Explained. There are two, two volumes. Both are amazing. And then also the author of Nicotine Explained, This Naked Mind Nicotine, which he wrote with our pal Annie Grace, and Diet and Fitness and then also, William, the, the workbook, right, came out, I think, relatively recently, the Alcohol Explained workbook. Yes. Um, yeah, that's right. Yep. Which is yeah. really, really cool. I have a copy of that. He lives over here with me in London, not with me, but in the same city. And he's got two kids. <laughs> um, and we're so excited to chat with you today. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I was gonna. I, I was gonna say that I. This is, and I know I say this a lot with the guests that we have. We are so fortunate to have so many wonderful people that we get to have conversations with. But I was especially excited about this conversation, William, because Alcohol Explained is what my my clients and I refer to as like kind of the alcohol bible. And so we, while we are Christian women who you know study scripture and meditate on scripture for truth and for um, renewing our minds and guarding our hearts and things like that. Alcohol Explained is this beautiful, for those of you who haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend getting it. You'll use it like a, like a reference, you know, a book. You'll pull it off the shelf and, and easily be able to look up whatever you're searching for. I have clients that make one pagers with like the things that they <laughs> highlighted to just, you know, it's to kind of continue putting that information in front of them as it relates to how the truth about alcohol and how it affects our bodies and our brains and what to do about it when we realize that, yeah, it's, it's not serving us anymore. So thank you so much for joining us and jumping right into maybe one of the biggest stories. We talk about the stories that keep us stuck in these in our drinking cycle, um, the over drinking cycle. And one of the big ones was it helps me relax. It helps me uh, relieve stress. I think that is so relatable. I've never, I've worked with thousands of people and I've never heard anyone say that that didn't apply to one of the reasons why they drank. And so I would love, maybe we could start there if you could maybe add some of the alcohol explained part as related to that story and why that story is, why, while it may seem true, um, yeah, the, it, why it's not. Yeah, no, absolutely. So tell me about that. that to be honest, that really is the starting point when you're talking about alcohol. It is, it, it's a sedative, a depressant. And, um, and of course, when I use the word depressant, I'm using it in its chemical sense as something that decreases or inhibits nerve activity. So when you consume it, you feel dulled, relaxed, whatever you want to call it. It has that sedative effect. And I think most people are kind of on board with that. But where it gets a lot more interesting is how the brain reacts to it. Because the human brain... Um, it creates and excretes a huge array of its own chemicals, drugs, and hormones. Now, a lot of these, you and your listeners would have heard, you know, things like cortisol and adrenaline and dopamine and endorphins, all of these things. It's a phenomenally complicated process, and we don't fully understand it. But what we do know as, as a principle is that the brain works by something called homeostasis, which is essentially a chemical balance. It's a balance of all these different different chemicals, drugs, and hormones. So your brain's constantly striving to maintain this chemical balance. So when you take something like alcohol, which is a sedative, your brain takes steps to counter it because your brain isn't designed to be working heavily sedated by this drug, this external drug. So it takes steps to counter it. So it releases things like adrenaline and cortisol, which is a stress hormone. But what it's really doing, it's, it's really trying to become overly sensitive to counteract the sedating effects of the alcohol. I often think of it as one of those old fashioned weighing scales, you know, with the bar in the middle and, and, and the two um, baskets at either side. So if you imagine when it's evenly balanced, generally you feel pretty good and positive. I'm not to say you don't have bad days, everybody does, but 
your starting point generally is to feel fairly resilient and confident. But when you start taking alcohol, you're upsetting that chemical balance. So if you think one basket's for sedatives and one's for stimulants, which do the opposite of sedatives, they wake you up and make you feel more alert. So as you lump a load into the sedative, the depressant basket, your brain lumps a load into the stimulant basket to even things up. So the problem there is the alcohol wears off and it leaves corresponding feeling of anxiety. So whatever feeling of relaxation or sedation you get from alcohol, when it wears off, it leaves a corresponding feeling of anxiety. So unfortunately, there's no free lunch with it. Whatever you gain in one hand, you know, you give up a few hours later in the other as that overstimulation kicks in. It's colloquially, you probably heard of it, that anxiety, mm. that anxious feeling you get when you're hungover. Um, and th- and that basically the explanation for it, the chemical explanation for it. it. It sometimes helps, I think, to draw an analogy. If you think if you're driving a car, so if you think you're in a car and your goal is to drive at exactly 30 miles an hour, okay, but you've got a completely flat road, it's a nice sunny day, there's no rain, no wind so you're driving along with your sort of very specifically pressed on uh, accelerator you don't have to move it at all and you're going along at 30 miles an hour if then you come off the concrete road and hit mud and gravel and wet and all the rest of it your vehicle's going to slow down so you have to push your foot harder on the accelerator to try and get up to 30 miles an hour um, but then if you suddenly come off the gravel and the wet and the mud and go back onto the dry concrete, your vehicle's going to fly ahead out of all control. And that's basically what happens when you drink alcohol. Yeah, that's so good. I love that analogy. I don't think I've, I, is that the car in the book? I can't remember, but that, I no, love that not, analogy. No, it's not in the book. I thought yeah, that one off. I don't think I remember that yeah. one. And I don't think I've ever heard that, that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so can you speak a little to then to how long it takes then to kind of like rebalance out? Because for me, I think one of the things that hit me like a ton of bricks, right, was that then this whole like attempt at bringing us back to homeostasis and all, all the crazy chemical imbalances that are going on, right, are even if you have a couple glasses of wine, this craziness is going on, what, six, I know it's some, you know, I've some people say six, some say 10 days later right so this is you're you're just making everything more stressful days later yeah it has a massive impact because as you can imagine on on a very basic chemical level you're going through that overstimulation point afterwards so that on its own will last it it depends of course how much you're drinking because if you're having one glass of wine your brain is balancing to one glass of wine so it's it's there but it's fairly minor but obviously if you're drinking three bottles of wine it correspondingly increased, it becomes absolutely massive. So that does impact things. But of course, the other thing, because we tend to drink in the evening before we go to bed, that stimulation kicks in when we should be sleeping. So that has a massive impact on your sleep, which again impacts how you feel over the next few days. So you're right, even in small, small quantities, that impact kind of resonates throughout the next few days. So it, it, it's almost ridiculous when you think of it, because even if you consider that that dull, sedated feeling is actually pleasurable, you're getting maybe 15 or 20 minutes of that, followed by the anxiety and the lack of sleep, and it kicks in and impacts you know you for days and days. So it, it's a ridiculously high price to pay for what you get. Yeah. And then we, and then we feel like that. We feel all those feelings and then we drink more to get rid of it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. When you, when you've got that chemical imbalance, it isn't a nice feeling. It's almost like when you drink too much caffeine and you feel really on edge and unpleasant and you, you know, just that gnawing feeling inside you. Um, there are two ways to get rid of that feeling. Okay. One is, as you said, just wait a few days for the chemical balance in your brain to get back to normal. But a far quicker way to get rid of that feeling is to have another drink. Because the reason you're feeling unpleasant is because your brain is geared up to work under the sedating effects of the alcohol, but the alcohol isn't there. It's almost making like an alcohol-shaped gap in your brain. Um, And the quickest way to get rid of it is to fill it with another drink. And that, unfortunately, is the great pleasure 
regular drinkers get from their nightly glass, two glasses, three glasses of wine, that wonderful feeling of relaxation and calmness that kicks in is no more than relieving an unpleasant feeling that it caused in the first place. Yeah, I know we have different analogies for that too. And we, Christy talks about, you know, it's like putting on a putting on a, high, a pair of high heels just to feel the relief of, you know, being able to yeah. like, take, take them off. And, and I was doing my daughter's ballet hair recently and, you know, she, and then it's tight and then she like comes home and she lets go. And I'm like, it's, it's so similar that, to that too. Like the cycle that I was stuck in was, you know, the, the drinking to be able to feel the release, just like if I was going to put a ballet bun in every single day yes. just to feel that. Yeah you know, relief from that. And it's easy to see how easy it is to get caught in that, that cycle for so long. And when you don't know that that's what it's doing. Yeah. I think that's one of the scary things as well, because when you're in that cycle, all your experience of life is that when you're not drinking, you feel pretty unpleasant. And when you are having a drink, it feels really good. Mm -hmm. So the thought of actually getting rid of it can feel really scary. I almost oh, yeah. liken it sometimes to, you know, if you're trapped in the sea on a raft and you're clinging onto this raft desperately, asking someone to stop drinking is almost like asking them to jettison the raft. But the interesting thing is, if you do let go of the raft, what you, what you actually find is you're standing in about two foot of water. You never needed the raft to begin with. Oh, oh that's good. Yeah. They're so, so true. I know. They're analogies. <laughs> good at the analogies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, that's my like language. Yeah. I think my, my native song that makes, that makes so much sense. And I, I think that's one of the hardest ones that when I have clients who, it, that's one of the, the stories that's the hardest to go. And it's like, you know, I, I, I try to say, yes, it, you know, it is easy to see where that story because of its effects, like the way that it does relax us for a period. And also what is the price that you're paying as a result? And, um, I mean, to, you know, think about the cortisol cocktail, if you will, and the mm. adrenaline and cortisol and the, I mean, the inflammation, all how that affects everything. Um, and then without an ability to discharge that as well, or if we're stuck in that cycle, we're taking another drink as opposed to going and running and getting, you know, being able to expel that. I know you covered that in the book as well. And that was something that was, that made so much sense to me. I'm like, yes, the stress of modern living, you know, collides with that and creates mm -hmm. the you know, almost just compounded effect. And um, can you speak a little bit more about, you know, what, I, what I'm talking about there? Yeah, I think it's just, so, so modern living is not very well suited to human life as we evolve. So, you know, we're not really designed to sit completely sedentary for six, seven, eight hours a day in an office staring at a screen. Um, so, it don't, it, you know, we're supposed to be moving around. We're supposed to be doing things. The other thing, of course, is when we get stressed, for not, not for everyone, but for a lot of us in Western society, stress doesn't necessarily translate into physical activity. So go back a few hundred years, stress would be physical stress. It was fight or flight. You would see a physical threat and you would either have to run from it or be prepared to fight. Either way, you would be working physically. Um, and that, of course, that, that relieves some of that stress, some of that adrenaline. But for us in modern society, it doesn't. You sit in an office, you get stressed, you, you work through whatever, but it's still there at the end of the day. It builds up there and it's very easy then to leave and to reach for you know a chemical substance to take the edge off that stress to unwind at the end of the day. And of course, it really feeds into itself because you then wake up the next day with the residual stress slash anxiety that's been caused chemically by the alcohol wearing off. And it's very easy to see how people get stuck in that cycle of, you know, the almost like the best part of their day is the moment they get home and pour that glass of wine. All they're um, really doing, you know, <laughs> I think a lot of people, absolutely, you're yeah. just almost waiting for the day to end so you can get back and pour that glass of wine. And of course, it's so common that people don't see it as addiction. But actually, it's exactly what it is. You're causing that withdrawal, that unpleasant feeling, and then you're, you know, systematically relieving it at certain points during the day. Yeah. yeah. 
One of the analogies that you also use, which I love, is that, and I'm going to butcher it, but the belief that we have about alcohol is what their bar is on our own prison. And, yes. Yeah. And so one of those beliefs and the first bar to go for me, right, was the sleep, the sleep bar, because not even just like waking up because of the cortisol and all that and just like being wide awake at 3 a.m., but the quality of the sleep, right, because your brain is not getting that through restorative rest. And so mm -hmm. that was the first one where I'm like, I need a gla giant glass of Cabernet Sauvignon on my bedside table so that I can get a good night's sleep, right? But when that went, and then he, I wasn't even clocking the same amount of hours in bed, right? I'm up at five now yeah. feeling great, but it's because of that quality of sleep. Can you speak a little bit to that like you do so eloquently in the book? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So um, but a lot of people think sleep is just a question of you know you lie down in bed and you fall unconscious for a few hours and you get up and you're good to go it, it, it nothing as simple as that at all when we humans sleep we sleep through very spe specific sleep cycles um there's lots and lots of different sleep cycles um so for example there's deep sleep which as you would expect you're very deeply unconscious but right on the other end of the scale there's something called rem sleep it stands for rapid eye movement. And the reason for that is when they monitor people in REM sleep, although their eyes are shut, they're flickering underneath their eyelids. Um, when, when they've attached sensors to people and monitored them through REM sleep, it's very interesting because their brain lights up almost as if they're fully awake. It's when we dream. Okay. So it's, it, 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 we don't know massive amounts about it, but it's a crucial part of our sleep cycle. Um, when you sleep naturally, you go through six or seven rounds of REM sleep. When you drink alcohol, or on average, drinkers go through three or four. It, there's also some other statistics. I have to remember these now. But I think if you, if you have one drink, uh, so usually your REM sleep, for most people, it's about two and a half hours. If you have one drink, it drops to two hours. If you drink four drinks, it drops to half an hour and anything over that, it's almost non-existent. Okay. So they've done tests with rats where they've starved them of REM sleep and they've actually died. And they've done voluntary studies with humans where they monitor, it sounds like great fun, this, you go <laughs> sleep in a lab and they monitor you. And when you go into REM sleep, they wake you up. So they're starving you of REM sleep. Um, and the people become very depressed, get very I disorientated. Would die. I would yeah, yeah. Die. The problem with it is people don't complete the study because it's voluntary and they become very depressed, very anxious, and they leave. So we don't know much about REM sleep, but it's this crucial part of sleep. Um, and of course, the problem is when you drink alcohol, for the first part of the night, you're too heavily sedated to go into REM sleep. But then after about five hours, the sedating effects wear off and the overstimulation kicks in. So that's where you wake up at three or four in the morning with your heart racing, you're really anxious, and you might be absolutely exhausted, but you're incapable of getting to sleep because of this chemical imbalance. It's the equivalent of, say you need eight hours sleep and you sleep from 11 o'clock to seven o'clock. Drinking alcohol is the equivalent of setting an alarm to three or four in the morning and getting up and drinking seven or eight massive mugs of strong black coffee to then lie there twitching and shaking and anxious and unable to get to sleep for the rest of the night. That's what it does. Um, I don't know if you've ever read Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep. Yeah. I so, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, so, so just very briefly, obviously, he's one of the foremost sleep scientists on the planet. Um, but he doesn't even use the word sleep when referring to the unconsciousness people experience after drinking. He says it bears absolutely no resemblance huh. to our normal yeah. sleeping patterns at all. So it has this massive impact on sleep, which obviously, again, all feeds into mental health and everything. But on the other side of things, where it gets very interesting, the reason people develop these very deeply held beliefs that they need alcohol to sleep is because if every night you have one, two, three however many glasses of wine or beers or whatever, your brain, that's sedating your brain, okay? So for we three here, we don't drink alcohol. So when you come towards bedtime, your brain naturally starts to close things down, 
starts, starts to release its own sedatives, its own naturally occurring sedatives, and you drift off into a natural sleep. And that's why we're often taught about the, the importance of good sleep hygiene, you know, like no white screens, keep things calm, bars, whatever, but just to you're sending a message to your brain to say, right, it's bedtime, so everything starts closing down. But when you drink alcohol regularly, your brain doesn't go through that process. It has no need to because it's relying on the alcohol, the nightly dose of alcohol to put you to sleep. So if you're drinking regularly and you think, oh, I have a day off, you will probably find you don't sleep at all because your brain isn't used to putting you to sleep. So this is why people develop, talking about the, you know, what you mentioned before, Christy, about the bars, our beliefs about alcohol forming bars for the prison that keep us in, enslaved. That's one of the ones because people's experiences, when I don't drink, I cannot sleep. So they believe that they need alcohol to make them sleep. But in fact, all it is, is you don't take a break long enough. If you stop drinking after a few nights, your brain starts picking up the slack again and starts going through that process. But if you're drinking regularly, you know, one night here or there just isn't enough. Yeah. I'm going to ask the question that I always get because you'll probably do it way better justice than I ever can. How long does that take then? when you're trying to regulate your sleep again and you're going on a break about well. So it's really hard to give a firm time scale, I'm afraid. So so the yeah. first thing, when you cut out alcohol, the first thing you will go through is that overstimulation stage where you're feeling like anxious, your appetite will drop off, you find it very hard to sleep. And that can last anything from one to five days. But the problem is when that regulates, quite often you can go the other way because don't forget if you're drinking even three, four, five nights a week, you're never getting enough mm. quality sleep. And if you're doing that for years or decades, you've got an awful lot of sleep to catch up on. So when you can finally get back into decent sleep, you need an awful lot of it to get back to normal. So what people often find when they're regular drinkers is they have anything once a five days or so of feeling anxious and you know not being able to eat, not being able to sleep, but then they go the other way. And they can be exhausted and need to sleep all the time. The longest I have heard that period last for was three months. Wow. Usually it's over within a month, a few weeks, but it very much depends on the individual. But what I would say is just trust the system because as we all know, when you come out the other side of that, it's just, oh, you you just think, oh my God, how, how have I been living like that? Yeah, instead of like me. So why would you ever wasted. go back? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I um, I mean, I I had written in, in my notes in the book, like, you know, um, how many times was I exhausted? And, you know, alcohol also giving me that sense that, you know, that if I was getting ready to go to a social event, okay, well, it will perk me up because it does have, you know, that also upper effect as well. Um. But then it was actually, you know, contributing to why I was exhausted in the first place and making it doubly hard to then be able to, like, I I was completely anesthetized to the fact that I needed deep rest and I was not getting it. And when you're stuck in that cycle for years and years and years, oh my gosh, it is just, yeah, it's baffling to me. And I always talk about this low irritability, this low grade irritability that I carried at all times when I was, you know, biting my family's heads off and things like that. And, and and it's easy to see not only because of everything that's happening when you're putting a poison into your body, but in addition to that, when you're not, you know, filling up your 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 tank, so to speak, with sleep, you know, with the sleep, with the rest it needs and and how hard it is to kind of reset that. But alcohol being the easy kind of place to to really um, you know, get some traction and some deep rest that we all, we all need. And the importance of sleep, that was something that I didn't realize either. Like, I'm like, yeah, I'll sleep when I'm dead. It's fine. <laughs> like, I'll just keep going. But it's at some like, point, it catches up with you. And, it does. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It does. And of course, the other thing, to, talking about like feeling lethargic and tired, obviously the impact on sleep is absolutely huge. But the other thing alcohol does is it increases our heart rate. Although it's a sedative because your brain's releasing adrenaline and cortisol to counter the alcohol that puts your heart rate up and that again is why after a few drinks people will notice their heart rate go up particularly when you wake up you know those three four a.m wake up so your heart's really beating fast but what a lot of people don't think unfortunately is that 
faster your heart goes, the more you want to sit down and rest. It's a simple fail-safe mechanism to stop you doing too much. And that's why exercise is difficult. You know, gentle exercise is fine, but the more you push yourself, the harder and harder and harder it becomes. So when your heart rate's already massively elevated, your energy levels are just dropped completely. That's what a lot of people don't realize with heart rate is as your heart rate goes up, it just robs you of energy. So you're constantly feeling more tired and more exhausted than you would do. So that regular drinking, all of these things sort of meld in where you haven't slept properly, your anxiety levels are up, you're feeling really tired. And of course, all of those things are greatly improved by a drink because it's an anesthetic. So it's correcting that chemical imbalance, which is making you feel better. It's anesthetizing the tiredness. So all of it, it appears to be crucial, but it's doing no more than relieving problems that it caused previously. And going to your point as well about it picking you up, um, it does because if you're not well, you feel, you know, when you're not well, you just want to crawl into bed and hide away. But when you feel well and healthy, you feel energetic. So when you're drinking alcohol, you're constantly ill because of that chemical imbalance, the tiredness, the increase in heart rate, the fact that it is a poison anyway and is not good for you. And then when you take an anesthetic, it immediately dulls all those unpleasant feelings down. And so you feel more energetic. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. It's like when you, I don't know if you've got kids, but you know, when they're not well and you give them like children's, children's paracetamol when they start bouncing off the walls, it's exactly the same for us. That's how I could put those party pants on. And despite, you know, <laughs> feeling exhausted, I'm like, okay, yeah. let's, let's go. But yeah. Little did I know I was just making it so much harder. To, I mean, it just, yeah, it's just mind blowing. And it's, you know, so much of what you share and the way that you share it is so, it just like, I was like, oh my gosh, like I feel, I feel so normal, you know, in, in this now that I, that I see this, um, it just really, it, it, it hits in a way that I think is really helpful. Um, one of my favorite things you say in the book, um, to kind of bring this in, I think it's just. It's so true. And this is not, I think with wine drinkers, we hear this a lot. Well, maybe beer drinkers too, but um, alcohol and, and taste. You know, I really, I, I like the taste of it. And um, if I may, I want to quote what you say about alcohol and paste. In, essentially, any alcoholic drink is something that tastes pleasant. For example, grape, grape juice with a very small amount of vile tasting poison in it, such that the drink as a whole is rendered palatable due to the good tasting part of it far outweighing the vile, vile tasting poison. In the same way, if you put a small amount of dog urine in a glass of orange juice, it would be palatable, providing the amount of urine was small enough that the pleasant taste of orange juice masked it adequately. I was like, that right there is so, so brilliant and so true. Can, can you talk a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's a very simple thing, but if you take 100% alcohol, it is completely, you can't see it's like ammonia. It makes your eyes water. If you were to try and drink it, it would make you physically sick. It's completely, uh, which we humans just can't consume it. It's unconsumable by human beings. But like anything, if you water it down a bit and put a load of refined sugar in with it, which we do with alcohol, it becomes, like, like I say, palatable. But the other thing, of course, is we do get used to it. So, you know, you've only got to look at children or, you know, young people taking alcohol for the first time it's foul you know you, you know you, you watch children sniffing at a glass of wine and they're like oh that's horrible and um, it's our natural reaction to it but like anything if you take it regularly enough you become used to it um and also of course our body uh, obviously we have the subconscious which is a very interesting part of the brain um but one of the things it, it can adapt to different situations we, in fact, all animals on the planet, none of them have a food supply that is certain enough that you don't have to be prepared for it, it falls short. So you need to find something else. So you know, very simply, we have hunger. And the more hungry you become, the more desperate you will become to try anything and to eat anything. Um, if you eat something that's unpalatable, but it appears to convey a benefit, your brain will start to want to desire it. You know, a lot of people say your taste buds change as you get older. Your taste buds don't change. Your taste buds are simply receptors. They're, they're receptors. Um, and the food doesn't change either. It's a chemical reaction. Taste is a chemical reaction between the, 
receptors in your mouth and the food, it does not change. But what does change is how your brain interprets it. So originally it will interpret it as this is strange and unusual. I don't like it. But if you have it enough times and it appears to get rid of your hunger and makes you feel slightly better when you have it, you will change your perception of it. And that's exactly what we do with alcohol. The first time we drink it, it tastes foul because it is poisonous and we are, you know, we're pre-programmed genetically to find it disgusting. But as we repeatedly force it upon ourselves, we become used to it. But also the brain is tricked by the effects of the drug because it does have that effect of sedating us. And over time, as the withdrawal kicks in and all the rest of it, we feel much better for having it. So our brain starts to reinterpret that from, you know, this is disgusting to actually, okay, it is disgusting, but it makes us feel better. So we'll start to find it more palatable. So good. It's so good. One of the, my favorite things that you write about in the second book is, um, you do a, like, this is what traveling with while drinking feels like, and this is what traveling without drinking feels like. And as someone who has done the flight from Los Angeles to London back and forth, probably like 50 times with tiny kids, like when I was reading that, I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. Like standing in line at the airport, actually no, it's perfect. I'm standing and being able to actually, when they're, when the kids are old enough to unplug and just watch screen, like yeah. sitting on an airplane for like 11 hours is actually, dare I say it, relaxing. When you yes. don't have phones or you can shut down your work for a bit, right? And so I was just yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is so true. And I always, I always direct my clients to that when they're talking about like doing their first alcohol-free vacation, because it's like, really, like, how do you want to come back from your holiday? Like, do you want to come back rested or do you want to come back wanting to murder your family? You know, <laughs> needing another holiday to get over it. It's so too, well, that was the thing I found. It was like the first time I went on a plane not drinking. And I just assumed that being on a plane made me feel kind of like really anxious and unpleasant. And, and, but it wasn't. It was the alcohol wearing off that was the unpleasant feeling. And actually, it's fine. You just sit on, you sit down for a few hours, which for most people is quite a pleasant thing to do. And you're right. I switch off all your work emails and laptop and sit yeah. over the book or something. It's not a problem. Um, I also noticed that that whole alcohol leaving your system thing now when I go like either to the movies here or the theater, right? Because you notice that people like are either like itching to get up or looking at their watches and, like come to interval, well, can't wait to get to the car. And I mean, I did that for years. And now I have a I have a 13 year old daughter that loves the West End like no other thing. And so I'm always in these shows with her and I'm like, I'm so glad I can fit through them and I'm not checking my watch to get to the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even that's what I used to find with concerts, shows, sporting events, or whatever. It's a lovely idea to sit there. Oh, yeah, I'll sit there and have a glass of wine or a beer or something and watch it. But you're either obsessing about the next one, or else going to the toilet, which was the other thing. I'd be up to the mm -hmm. toilet every five minutes, or queuing yeah. to queuing at the bar because everyone's doing the same thing. So between you know getting alcohol inside you and then getting rid of it afterwards, you end up missing virtually the whole event anyway. That, I had that reminder a lot of here this summer when I went to one of my favorite concerts and, um, and you know, you wait for the song that like, you, that's mm. not as popular. Right. But then everybody leaves and floods the bar at that point. And I'm sitting there with the song that's not as fun and everybody's left me, which I'm like, this is incredible. I'm, I just get to sit here and, and they're all fighting for a room at the bar and using the, yeah. using the bathroom too. And See, oh, just another reminder of why I just, I love not being, you know, not ever having to drink again. Would you briefly give us your, um, your kind of your story? Like, how did you get to where you live alcohol free? What is, what is your background? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I, I mean, I started drinking and smoking when I was about 14. And then I gave up smoking, I think in my mid twenties. I, I don't know if you've heard of Alan Carr, but his mm -hmm. quit yeah. smoking book. Um, and I found that really interesting because he took such a kind of pragmatic and common sense approach to it. And I ended up reading a lot of his stuff and I read his alcohol book, which I kind of enjoyed at one level, but on the other level, it, a lot of what he said didn't seem to quite ring true with me. So for example, he said that um, there's no physical withdrawal to alcohol, which wasn't my experience of it at all. I found myself very anxious and shaky after I've been drinking a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and he also said that 
when we start drinking, the reason why it's hard to just have one or two and why you want to keep drinking is because it dehydrates you, but it makes you thirsty and you want to drink more. And again, that just wasn't my experience. I, I always found it hard to stop drinking when I started, but it was never because I was thirsty. I was always chasing a particular feeling. So I think I stopped smoking, but I continued to drink for 25 years. But I think because I'd read that, I was very, I very much had that in mind when I was drinking. Um, so my drinking became heavier and heavier. And there were a few things I could probably point to which kind of accelerated it a bit. But it ended up, it's, in fact, it's 10 years this coming February since I quit. But I started drinking, um, I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday lunchtime with work. And I just carried on day and night, kept going and sort of crawled out the other side of that five or six days later. And um, just thinking, I can't keep doing this because that was, I was never a regular drinker. I was a binge drinker. So I would always stop. I'd drink very heavily and then stop for a few days and then go back to it. Um, so that was, as I said, that was 10 years ago, but I literally, I crawled out of there feeling absolutely awful. I thought I cannot, cannot keep doing this. I have to stop. And I'd already had quite a few years of analyzing my drinking and thinking about it to quite a deep degree. And I think that was what allowed me to quit because I'd already pieced a lot of it together. And then I pieced a lot more of it together, having quit. And then obviously writing the books as well was very I suppose therapeutic for me, but it, setting it all out in book form kind of helped me piece it all together myself. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, that was my story. What was the last kind of bar on your prison, the last belief or benefit that, that was the, the hardest for you to let go of when it came to ditching alcohol? Well, funnily enough to me, I didn't do it the easiest way because I didn't get rid of all those bars before I quit. So when I quit drinking, my mindset at the time was I cannot keep doing this. I just can't. I can't have one or two. Whenever I drink, I drink loads and loads and loads and I cannot keep doing that. It's destroying me. So I can't have alcohol anymore. But it means I'm not going to enjoy social occasions or vacations or Christmas. They're just going to be dull, uninteresting events because I don't have a drink with me. So I think those, those were the mm. last few because they, those bars were removed for me after I'd actually quit alcohol because, you know, I would go on a holiday, go on vacation thinking I'm not going to enjoy this. And of course you do enjoy it. It's different, but you enjoy it. And in fact, now I can't, you know, we, we just come back from holiday um, and, and there's people there that literally, and this is what I used to do and I don't people why I'm, I find it surprising, but it just, it's all yeah. for me to think that I was doing the same thing. For me, it was about alcohol. It was about a week or two weeks where I could drink unrestrainedly. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I was interested in. You know, getting to the airport was exciting, not yes. because I was getting on a plane to go on holiday, but because I could go straight to the bar at six in the morning and start drinking. You yes. have. Um, and, and that was the fun bit for me. And, and so it was actually realizing, you know what? The only thing I enjoyed about it was the alcohol. And now the alcohol has gone. I can actually enjoy the holiday. You know, I can sit and relax. I can enjoy the food. I can get loads of sleep and proper sleep so I feel good. I can go for walks around the local town. I can do whatever I like. There's no work. I don't have to cook or clean or anything. I'm actually enjoying the holiday rather than enjoying being allowed for two weeks of the year, being able to drink as much as I want. Yeah. So those were the last bars that disappeared for me, socializing and enjoying like Christmas, family barbecues, holidays, vacations, all of it without alcohol. And as I say, the reason they were last is because for me, I had to experience it and to realize actually there's more to life than drinking. Yeah, so true. So good. Yeah, I, I, that was a big, big story for me too. There, I didn't think there'd be any way to enjoy those things but to be fair i'd never been on vacation without alcohol that and yeah. that's something that yeah you know i coach clients all the time i'm like but have you ever done a vacation without alcohol you have nothing to compare it to so just at least you know try give it a good try and see what you you know make that kind of like experimental mindset of it and see what is mm -hmm. different and um you can always go back to the next vacation and, and drink if you want like if it's not yeah. enjoyable but just yeah. see what you're missing so um yeah i think that's so relatable 
I wanted to touch on this because I, with a little bit of time we have left, um, because, you know, talking about the stories that keep us stuck and the head noise that comes along with, you know, the, being stuck in that cycle. Um, can you kind of touch on the spiral of craving and how, yeah. I mean, like, this is like, y'all, if you've made it this far in the, you know, listening to this, like, do not <laughs> stop now. Like, this is going to be like light bulbs. Um, yeah, if you could kind of walk us through that. A so, yeah, so good to we mentioned that because obviously we've talked about the mechanics of drinking, how it makes you feel before, during and after. But of course, for me personally, the backbone of it wasn't that aspect. It was what you've just mentioned, what I call the spiral of craving. And it's almost like that session, that preoccupation with something. And I think it's always useful to give an example here, because let's say you're a habitual evening wine drinker. Okay. So you've been at work or you've been running around after the kids or housework or whatever it might be you've been doing all day. And you're really looking forward to your five o'clock glass of wine. Now that should be inherently enjoyable. Like I'm work at work at the moment. I'm looking forward to going home, sitting down and relaxing. So when you're working or running around during the day, when you get to the evening to you time, that should be inherently enjoyable. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're just sat at home in front of the TV or reading a book or out with friends, or, you know, we've just been talking about vacations. Let's say it's a big one and you're going on vacation. All of those things are inherently enjoyable situations. Okay. But to enjoy them, you have to be paying attention to them and appreciating them. Okay. So if you're trying to do any one of those things, but you start thinking, you know what? I'd really like a drink to top it off, but I can't have one because it's not good for me. I'm trying to quit, but could I have one on just this occasion? Wouldn't it be lovely? Suddenly, you're not thinking about the vacation, the relaxing at home, the nice meal, the company of your friends. That, all of that might as well not exist. You might as well be sat in a prison cell for all the attention you're paying and all the pleasure you're getting from it. Because in instead, your attention is taken up with this unpleasant internal tantrum about whether or not you can't drink. Mm -hmm. So if you then give up and think, you know what, this is intolerable. I deserve some pleasure out of life and I can't enjoy myself without it. You have your glass of wine. It's a placebo at that point because it's releasing you from that unpleasant internal tantrum and it's allowing you to concentrate on the TV program, concentrate on your book, enjoy your meal, or enjoy the company of your friends or enjoy your vacation, whatever it is. It's not actually doing anything other, other than removing that unpleasant internal tantrum that you're dealing with, that craving. And of course, our experience then is when I didn't have a drink, I didn't enjoy my vacation, evening out with friends, evening at home, whatever. But when I had the drink, I could enjoy it. And in that way, again, talking about the bars, that becomes another really important bar in our prison. And it's a bar that says alcohol tops everything off. And without it, I really don't enjoy anything else. So just to explain what that process is, it's when you start basically fantasizing about something. So you're sat there and you're thinking about that, you know, pouring a glass of wine or that ice cold beer or whatever. And oh, wouldn't it be perfect? It wouldn't I feel good? And so you're almost teasing yourself. It's like being hungry and teasing yourself with the thought of your favorite food. It's not a pleasant place to be. And funny enough, I was talking to my sister about this and she was talking about her own drinking. And she was saying to me, I, you know, I'm reading your book about this craving. She said, I don't really have these massive cravings that you talk about. And I said, well, cravings, the extreme side of it, but it doesn't have to be like a real white knuckle craving. It can just be a mild distraction. You know, you might be out with friends and enjoying their company, but at odd moments just think, oh, if only I could have a drink. It's like a cloud hanging over you. In its most extreme form, it's that real gut-wrenching craving for something. But it goes all the way down to, like I say, just to like a mild distraction, but it's still there. But the key is, it's a purely conscious thought process. And having a drink relieves it, but it isn't actually doing anything just removing a thing that it's created in the first place. It's such a trick. Such a trap. <laughs> it's just a, yeah. It's such a lie. It's, such a lie. it's so, all but, such a lie. But I mean, it's, it's so similar to when I was pregnant. I, I don't crave tuna fish. 
regularly, mm-hmm. like like a tuna fish sandwich. But when I was pregnant, all three of my pregnancies, I like I craved it. And I mean, I know you can eat whatever, and I maybe had it, but I had to pay attention to it. And it was the same for sushi. It was like, oh my gosh, I've never wanted it more. And yet another thing that trapped me in the drinking cycle, like. There's like a hundred yeah. things. I'm like, of course it did, you know? And that's where yeah. we talk about too, where, you know, if we can start it from that, if we start from that place of feeling like, oh, it's wrong with me in that shame place where I started. And a lot of people say, you know, start and just open to the information, um, you know, the facts, the truth and get curious about it. It's like, wow, no, this, this is my responsibility, but it's, it's not my fault. And I'm so yeah. full. I know what I know now. And I'm able to, uh, you know, I was able to apply it, get that experiential knowledge that says, yeah, vacation is a whole lot more fun this way. And all of these things. Um, so yeah, I think those, that's true. those thoughts it's... don't happen anymore, you know? Yeah. No, it's so true what you say though. You see, this is the problem with it because we choose to have each and every drink. No one's thought, well, people could press you to have a drink, but they can't force you to have a drink. So because we choose and we want every single one of these drinks, we start to think it's our fault and there's something wrong with us. And that's true for everyone, I think, when they start to realize it's not what it's always cracked up to be. We blame ourselves for it, but that, that's the key point. You're not to blame for this. It's an addictive substance. And over time, with repeated doses, you become addicted to it. It's as simple as that. It's nothing wrong with you personally. It's the substance. Yeah. I wonder if we can um, kind of like end on uh, what I hope will be like a really positive answer from you in that, like, how have you seen the landscape um, sober and sober curious and the movements and all these things and the offerings of non-alcoholic beverages since you first wrote the book till now? Because, I mean, there's sober Instagram, which you and I are both a part of, and there's like people everywhere that are now looking at this and it's now become like okay this is a a wellness conversation you know this Mm. is the biggest health hack that you can actually do this is for anti-aging all of it now we're finally finally starting to like really talk about it like what what has that change in landscape look like from your perspective so so the biggest change from what i see of it is it's no longer what it used to be when I first wrote the book. It was people who were, you know, chronically alcohol dependent that were looking to stop because they were chronically alcohol dependent. But now that's not what people are asking themselves. They're no longer thinking, do I have a serious dependency on alcohol? They're asking, in my mind, the correct question, am I getting more out of this than I'm putting in? Okay. And the answer is no, of course not. So it's opened up that sobriety to, to everyone, no matter who they are. You know, there's people, I I know people who drank one or two glasses of red wine a week. You know, in most contexts, that would be considered completely normal and healthy, but they'd quit. And with good reason, because it's not benefiting them. And I think that's, that's the big change. It's that shift in perspective, that shift in perspective from before, this is a great substance and I only give it up if I have to, to thinking, Mm -hmm. actually, this is not a great substance at all. Yeah. Yeah. What is one um, so tiny good. new action that you would leave our listeners with? Besides go buy the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that, that's what I would say, y'all. Yes. Yeah. 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 Same. Just go get the alcohol Bible. It's called yeah. Alcohol Explained. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I would say to people to really concentrate because we're all incredibly busy people and we don't have enough time to sit and really concentrate on the experiences as we go through them. And I think that was one of the things that opened up my eyes was to actually drink, you know, if you are still drinking, to really concentrate on it and and to take away the entire situation. So, you know, instead of just having a drink when you're out with your friends and thinking, oh, this is great fun, stop and try and think, well, what part of this is enjoyable because I'm with my friends? And what part of it is enjoyable because of this slightly dulled feeling I'm getting from the alcohol? And I would say, Apply that as well to when you quit drinking, because a lot of the time people focus on what's missing, i.e. I don't have that five o'clock glass of wine, but they don't focus on all the other benefits they're getting, like they're waking up not feeling awful. It's it's such a simple thing. And I think, and this isn't criticizing people because I do it myself, but we're very good at taking things for granted. The benefits of sobriety come slowly, so it's very easy to miss them and take them for granted. So that is what I would say, just just really concentrate on all of it. You know, 
don't belittle waking up in the morning not feeling rubbish yeah. because it's such a great thing. It's the best yeah. ever. Whoever thought it was possible? <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, it's, yeah, mind blowing. Oh, thank you so, so, so much, William. We so loved having you. I got through half my much notes, pleasure. but yeah, they'll get. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might have to do a part part two at some point. Oh, two, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic! No, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank, thank you. you. This has we been will, awesome. We will see you, ladies, next Monday. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. You can find all of our episodes at butjesusdrankwine.com and make sure you follow us over on the gram at Love Life Sober with Christy and Mead at I'm Not Sober, I'm Free. To learn more about what we do, you can visit our websites at meadhollandshirley.com and lovelifesober.com. Take a screenshot of this podcast and share it with a friend or two. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't have to worry about missing a single episode. And if you love what we're doing, please leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. This helps more women who are feeling stuck and alone in the overdrinking cycle to find hope and encouragement. Thanks, ladies. We so appreciate you. We'll see you next week.